The Benjamin Dixon Show is only possible with listener support. Go to www.patreon.com forward slash the BPD show. Today is Tuesday, August 31st, 2021. We begin not only in Afghanistan, we begin also with COVID-19, and we have a trifecta in this country, in our situation as Black people, where we're faced with the intersection of so many different confluences of bigotry and white supremacy along the lines of capitalism and colonialism. We are facing so many different intersections at any given point. There's a lot to unpack. And it's manifesting itself in what we see happening with COVID-19. It's manifesting itself in what we're seeing in Afghanistan. And it is certainly manifesting itself in what we see as Black people in this country. But first, let's begin with On the Clock with Georgia Ford. It was the deadline that President Biden announced for withdrawing all troops from Afghanistan. Many questioned his strategy and wondered, would he stick to it after three deadly attacks at the airport claimed the lives of 13 U.S. service members and left more than 100 Afghans dead? This morning, we check in with an update from General Kenneth McKenzie, the commander of U.S. Central Command. I'm here to announce the completion of our withdrawal from Afghanistan and the end of the military mission to evacuate American citizens, third country nationals, and vulnerable Afghans. The last C-17 lifted off from Hamad Karzai International Airport on August 30th this afternoon at 3.29 p.m. East Coast time. Look, there's a lot of heartbreak associated with this departure. We did not get everybody out that we wanted to get out. But I think if we'd stayed another 10 days, Louis, we wouldn't have gotten everybody out that we wanted to get out. And there still would have been people who would have been disappointed with that. But I want to emphasize again that simply because we have left, that doesn't mean the opportunities for both Americans that are in Afghanistan that want to leave and, uh, and Afghans who want to leave, they will not be denied that opportunity. I think our Department of State is going to work that very hard in the days and weeks ahead. Can you assure the American public that every single U.S. service member is now out of Afghanistan? Every single U.S. service member is now out of Afghanistan. I can say that with 100 percent certainty. So there it is, the update uh, right, right from uh, General Commander Kenneth McKenzie. You know, all of the U.S. troops are out of Afghanistan now, Ben. And this marks the end of the longest war. Um, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about this coming to an end? You know, this is a uh, significant culmination of a, of a period in American history where we have two generations, the generation that was alive on 9-11, the generation that was born that day and going forward, that we all intersected into the same war. Um, children born on 9-11 served in this war. It was time. Um, but we do also have to consider the opposite side of this Um while I do look at what Joe Biden has done and I look at it favorably um, because it was what had to be done, there is the flip side of it. And that is the concern for the lives of all of the people who did not get out. And as the general was speaking there, uh, categorizing it as a disappointment, the fact is that disappointment is coupled with tragedy and trauma for families who missed the flight. Um, and so I'm not so easily, I'm not so readily um, to dismiss it as a disappointment so much as the stories and lives of all the people who are now trapped uh, behind those lines. You know, I was reading the stories from some of the people who did leave and there was a women's rights activist who said that in order to get to the airport, she walked through the sewer pipe mm. for miles. Mm. And another story that you heard a father explaining to his son that the gunfire was a celebration to try to ease his child from worry or concern about his own safety. And so when you read those stories and then I, you know, that I juxtapose that with seeing people gather in front of the White House when I was in D.C. this weekend and forming their own 
protest That's to right. protect Afghans because we are we already have a population of Afghans in our nation. And these are their brothers, their sisters, right. their mothers, their cousins, their uncles, their friends that now they have to worry about, you know, and yeah. uh, the the other side of that is what is the Taliban's plan going forward? I know you you've spoken extensively about them being acknowledged as the you know official uh, government entity. What is their plan with governing this nation going forward? Well, then now <laughs> that's a complicated question and a great question, um, because what is the plan of any uh, governing authority in a region? It is to have the monopoly on violence within that region. And that's is a definition from um, uh, Max Weber, um, who, who put it as such. It is the legitimate monopoly on violence. And so in the United States, we see that as the police state. And that's what black people intersect with every single day. In Afghanistan, under the rule of the Taliban, you can be assured that they are going to carry out a far right wing theocratic style government that aligns um, with the doctrine of their interpretation of Islam, which is quite antithetical to so many Muslims across the globe. But that is a conversation for their community to have. But as it pertains to what they plan to do. They plan to be a legitimately recognized state on the international stage, the legitimate regime there. But that does not mean that they are not going to uh, wield their power as a bludgeoning tool over the people over whom they rule. Is that. Is, is, is it safe? You know, when you talk about the the type of of violence and the level of violence and the consistent use of violence that we've <laughs> seen from the Taliban, you know, that I think for me, that is the concern. I, I get it in, in saying that they're going to have the monopoly on the mm -hmm. use of violence, but what we've seen from them historically is that they use violence often. Yeah. Yeah. And this is where this is, I mean, this is the, the crux of the situation, right? And this is where we can see multiple sides to the argument. And this, uh, and while Brother Mac is not here, his argument is still resounding very loudly. You have to take in consideration the people who are going to be the receiving end of that monopoly on violence that is now being wielded by the Taliban. And in so much as they, they um, subscribe to a fundamentalist interpretation of uh, Islam, um, that, just like the fundamentalist interpretation of Christianity, is oppressive to women. Because let's be sure, we are just one Supreme Court decision away from losing uh, a woman's right to choose in this country. And while some people may not consider that as violence, it is a step towards violence that is the same ideology, that far right wing fundamentalist interpretation of any religion is a threat to humanity. Yeah, so it's a catch-22. Before we switch gears here, we're anticipating that President Biden will make a, a statement addressing the withdrawal from Afghanistan. What do you think he's he's going to touch on? Um, he's going to try to validate his strategy. Um, but one thing about Joe Biden, he's he is a curmudgeonly um, um, old guy. And he's not going to apologize for any of this. And I don't think he should in this case, because this is the best that you can make out of a soup sandwich that was the entire war on terror. We had no right to be there as an occupying force uh, for 20 years, no more than we have the right to be an occupying force in Korea, North, in, in not North Korea, but in Korea in general and the occupying force across the globe in so many places for the last decades. Right. The United States has made a soup sandwich on the international stage and Joe Biden got stuck with the hot potato. I do not believe he's going to apologize, nor do I think he should. Well, they are saying that it's caused his ratings to go down. Uh, people calling it a fail failure. People saying that they don't believe in his leadership after this exit strategy. But I lean more on the side of. Yeah. How how did people expect it to go? Right. Really? And how much longer did people expect us to stay? Right. I think the thing that concerns me is now, what is the strategy moving forward? Do, do the folks with the military intelligence feel that those airstrikes got the folks who were responsible for 
the explosions at the airport that ultimately took the life of 13 U.S. service members. My question, and and I don't know if he's going to address this, but what I want to hear from him today is, do they plan to continue using force in Afghanistan Mm -hmm. uh, because of those three attacks? Or or did they get who they were looking for in the airstrike? That's right. Right. Um, And and while the United States may not have troops on the ground, one thing we have uh, cavalierly wielded across the international stage is our ability to access any region through drone strikes. So the real question is, are we going to continue drone strikes in Afghanistan? And I'm quite sure that might not be a question he was is going to be willing to answer today. But it would be a great question from a journalist. But he threw that information out so carelessly, you know, in response to the first explosions. He was very candid that we are not going to forgive and that we will get whoever is responsible, you know, which I think was, I I guess, for that felt like it was more for the American people. Oh, to yeah. have confidence in him than it was actually uh, for um, military strategy. Because why would you ever want your opponent to know what you're up to? <laughs> At the risk of being called a um, a neoliberal, I'm reminded of a scene from the American president, Michael Douglas. And he is faced with the decision, a fictional decision of whether or not he should strike a country. The military industrial complex in that movie demanded a certain level of language and bellicosity. And we see that is real. That is not life imitate. That is not art imitating life. That is, well, you got it. I have to flip and reverse it. That is the reality of our military industrial complex. It is present in reality right there in Joe Biden's ear. He is having to grapple with the reality again that we have to get out of there. But there is a infrastructure around Joe Biden that is demanding blood because they profit off of it. And so in their closing salvo, they had a drone strike. And whether or not there's a justification of it in that movie, Michael Douglas said that at a certain point, we have to not appear strong. We have to be strong. And sometimes being strong means we can take it on the chin and walk away because striking at the last hour is sufficient to create more problems in the future. So I mm-hmm. agree with you, Georgia, as convoluted as, as, as long as it took for me to get that point out. The fact is, is that Joe Biden could have shown a new level of strength that is required for leadership in this international stage. And that is the ability to not strike back because, of course, we have the capacity to go in there and obliterate them. But do we have to demonstrate that at every opportunity? And at the cost of seven children who were killed in that airstrike. That's right. That's right. I do want to acknowledge the troops who have been fighting for our country over the last 20 years, the veterans, those who have served to protect us. This conversation has largely become political and about Biden and about the Taliban, but American troops have sacrificed time with their families, time away from home and their lives to keep us safe. And so I want to center them this morning and just, you know, if you uh, have, have fought in a war or if you spent any time there, uh, we appreciate you Mm. know that. Yeah. Uh, Turning now, a Pennsylvania congressional candidate, Teddy Daniels, has a lot to say about uh, the pandemic. And he's on the side that is is fueling a lot of the, I'll say, controversy. Take Mm -hmm. a listen. This is still America, Tucker. Okay, if if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. Yeah. If if I if you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. That's what makes this country great with the vaccines. If you've had that conversation with your doctor and you feel a vaccine is the best route for you, go for it. Cool. But for those that don't, that's also cool. You know, let people live their lives. Wait, but shouldn't we kill people who don't get the vaccine? Well, that's what the left wants to do. Yeah, I've noticed. You know, that's what they want to do. I see a bunch of states right now, they're looking, well, New York City just did it, the vaccine passport. To, you know, they're going to start enacting it if you want to go to restaurants. Who the hell does this? 
Seriously. Well, they, I, I guess if you allow people totally unlimited power and no one ever pushes back, I haven't seen a Republican in Congress fight against this. The governor of South Dakota, Kristi Noem, was supposed to be the great conservative hope. She said yesterday, well, I'm, I'm not going to sign a bill that, that prevents vaccine mandates because vaccines are good. I think. And you're like, well, why? I thought, wait a second, Kristi Noem, what about the freedom you said you were going to defend? Yeah. Nope, nope. The government's response when this whole pandemic started should have been this. Now, you've got to remember, I, I, I come from the communist state of Pennsylvania yeah. to where they divided people from essential and non-essential employees. I very well. Okay? And this business can stay open, but this one has to close. Right. Do you know how many people lost their businesses, Tucker? Mm. So maybe controversy wasn't the correct choice of word. Maybe propaganda mm. would serve him better. Mm. But we're seeing this continued. I, I don't know if you saw the air quotes around pandemic. That's, That's right. But you've you've been sharing this, Ben. I've been seeing this in the afternoons. You're posting about radio personalities and pastors who were anti-vaccine, anti-mask, who have now died to COVID. Yeah. And yeah. so to see this, this rhetoric, to see this propaganda, not just on YouTube, but this is on, this is on Tucker Carlson's show. That's right. That's right. Tucker Carlson has millions of viewers every single day. And I, I would argue, Georgia, that controversial should be the word. Right. The way we should look at this in society is controversial, but we don't because we have become accustomed to the propaganda to the extent that one of the most popular hosts in the country, Tucker Carlson, is able to peddle conspiracy theories as uh, along with snake oil. The ivermectin, he, he's a part of that narrative. And now they're promoting this idea that is is so I want to I want to I want to hold the pin there. The flip side of this is I never expected them to believe their own lies. And I think that's what you're getting to, because you have conservative radio hosts and pastors and politicians who are getting sick with COVID-19 and actually dying from it. And so my thing is, it's one thing for this to be propaganda, but it should not only be controversial, but I think it should be such an anathema to us that we see this as people who have dispensed with their sense of survival. They are they are they are killing themselves because of their politics. Oh, yeah. And and this guy, he's running for office. Teddy Daniels, he's a con congressional candidate. And what is dangerous is the fact that he's putting this out there. If he gets support and he gets in, this is another vote. That's right. This is another That's vote right. that impacts the lives of those who live in Pennsylvania Right. This is another political force that impacts the national stage as well. Yeah. He he also served, uh, and thanks to David for um, pointing this out, served the Trump campaign as the Northeast U.S. Director of Vets for Trump. Mm. Mm. And that so makes sense. He he is he's well versed, and he has uh, support uh, not just in his his district, but. Because of that connection with Trump, he has a lot of uh, national uh, affiliations as well. Yeah. So he had his his sphere of influence is vast. And here you have this man putting air quotes on a pan pandemic that has killed how many people nationally Getting and internationally? Close, we're coming. And you well, want to put oh air quotes goodness. around that? Internationally. Sister Ford. Um, when you said internationally, it reminded me of what's happening um, even in India, right? There are reactionaries all across the globe who have seized power in these countries. And that's what this guy is. He's looking to get another piece like Marjorie Taylor Greene of the power structure that is the American empire. And we should be terrified that this is the regime, the regime of ignorance 
that has seized power in the form of the right wing conservative movement that was championed and heralded by Donald Trump. He is not the creator of that movement. And that movement has gotten so big that it has now eaten him. It is out of control. And the pathway to power and economic privilege for conservatives now is to ignore the reality of a pandemic that has killed nearly 700,000 people in America alone. You know, and it what frustrates me is because then you juxtapose that with candidates like Nina Turner, mm. who were honestly running on truth and were mm. were running to disrupt change and how in our community, you know, that can be seen as, you know, I, I don't know, it, it, but she's running on truth. And here you mm. have someone who is simply just running on propaganda and the thought that he he will actually be elected, he yeah. could actually be elected, it disheartens me because yeah. the integrity that's required to be a politician is in this nation is little to none. You don't, mm. integrity is not a requirement, mm. you know, and, and it's a I liability. wish more people in our community would not feel like they are not qualified. You know, I hear that a lot of people, oh, you know, or I have this in my background or I don't have the experience. Listen, we have people, Republican um, hopefuls who who are, are running on lies and winning. Mm. Mm. The, that is the pathway to victory for them. And it has led to many of them not being able to distinguish from the reality that is an objective truth and the reality that they have crafted in their minds that is built on the propaganda that they have gotten over the last 20 years from outlets like Fox News, who is now more than happy to put something where to the tune of eight million dollars a year in the hands of Tucker Carlson because he is a master propagandist. But the problem is, is that because they no longer can distinguish between their own propaganda and the truth, they're running up against the freight train that is COVID-19. And so while I do hope that they are all vaccinated because them participating in that community wide activity helps us all. The truth is some of them are dying and uh, death is pretty permanent. Your political position should be flexible enough to accommodate life, um, especially from a party that considers itself to be pro-life. You know, and Tucker Carlson is not the only one who's using his platform. I know we've spoken about him a lot. And if you're not a right winger, you might not even know that some of these shows exist. I want to play a, a clip really quick from True News. This is another program that is highlighting this type of propaganda. I think that in America, we are eventually going to face vaccination camps, quarantine camps, punishment for people who choose not to be vaccinated or to vaccinate their children? Do you think parents are going to lose their children? Um, they're going to have them taken away uh, because they're not seemed, deemed fit to be parents because they choose not to put an experimental jab in their children. Yeah, I think we could see that. And you're right. I, Australia does appear to be a canary in the coal mine. And, and uh, right, a three-month time lag sounds about right. Uh, once the fall, uh, what used to be the fall flu season hits, um, we're going to have mass hysteria. And I know that a lot of parents have already planned for this. Um, they made difficult decisions with their, their children not to, to send them back to the public schools here, which are essentially indoctrination and will be quarantine camps themselves. The scarlet letter is now a U. Um, for young kids, whether they're on K through 12 campuses or college campuses or at the service academies, we essentially have de facto quarantine vaccination camps already. And so this is stemming from a situation where a parent did lose their rights um, in Chicago. Take a look at this clip. It may be a first-of-its-kind case. A Cook County judge here at the Daly Center has stripped a Chicago mom of her parenting rights because she's refused to get the COVID vaccine. And he is a very sweet boy. He's my whole world. You miss him. <laughs> I miss him more than anything. Rebecca Furlitt has been divorced for seven years and shares custody of her 11-year-old son with her ex-husband, what had been a 50-50 split in parenting time. 
But on August 10th, in an unrelated child support hearing, Cook County Judge James Shapiro asked Furlitt whether she'd been vaccinated. When she told the judge no because she's had bad reactions to vaccines in the past, Judge Shapiro stripped Furlitt of all of her parenting time until she agrees to get vaccinated. I think that it's wrong. I think that it's dividing families, and I think that it's not in my son's best interest to be away from his mother. Furlitt is now asking the appellate court to stay the judge's order. Her attorney saying the judge has overstepped his authority. And you have to understand. Mm-hmm. The fa- you know, I, I do have, a, I wonder if the judge is related to Ben Shapiro. I'm, you know, just <laughs> what? Well, <laughs> but you know, I, you know, here's, here's, here's a situation that I see in the, in this one, Georgia. Um, I, people, this, this scenario is parent. There are a group of parents in this country that are asking for permission to be able to put their children's life at risk of dying from COVID-19, particularly the Delta variant, because that has mutated from what was something that originally was not a significant threat as far as percentages to children. The Delta variant is killing children. And these people are asking for permission because they are their parents to put their children in harm's way. I just need us to observe the absurdity of the moment that we're living in. And I do believe that if you are so, are, are so, I, I, I just, I'm going to stop there. I can't. Well, what are your thoughts about specifically this mother losing her rights? If she was going go to, far? should there be that much regulation on vac- vaccines? Death is pretty permanent. And as this as this continues to mutate, we are getting we it is get becoming more and more clear that because of the ignorance of America and the ignorance of that right wing reactionary movement that is global, we are going to continue to see variants of COVID-19 morph until the point where we all are going to have to go back into full quarantine and we would have lost at least a million people in this country. If parents are so committed to their desire to not get vaccinated, fine. But do you have the right to put your children's life at risk? Absolutely not. And so when you looked at that first clip from True News, we saw this exaggeration from a story like this, right? Where it starts out where this parent is losing visitation rights and then it gets Uh, blown up into full-blown concentration camps. Now, there are no reports of that at this time. And I don't see regulation developing to, to that level. But Ben, to your point, this is a matter of life and death, especially for children now. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, but I, I will say this, I do think if we're moving in the direction of taking parents uh, their visitation rights away. I I do think that we should be moving in the direction of online school again. Yeah. Uh, to me, that feels very contradictory that you'll be hurting children in yes. these classrooms. Oh yes. Without having to yeah. wear masks. In some instances, there's a ban on mask mandates. And then the other piece is you know, that uh, there is not vaccination cards required to go into mm-hmm. the schools in, in some cases. So if we're moving in the direction of holding the parents that responsible, I think we should also be protecting our children and, and just allowing them to do distance learning again. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I could not agree more. And herein lies the complicity of the uh, Democratic leadership in the form of Joe Biden. Um, you know, as as much as I may agree with the decision to pull out of Afghanistan uh, because of my principled anti-war stance, I also see that there are so many Democratic leaders who have participated in this notion that we should get back to normal by sending our precious children into petri dishes that are public schools. There is no part of this that we should be looking at and considering sending our children back into this pandemic. But because we are here to serve the power structure, everyone is saying send our kids back to school. I couldn't agree with you more, Georgia. 
Well, it is that time, Ben. I know that you have lots planned for this morning. Yeah. So coming up in the next block, Stacey Mitchell, co-director at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and she is the author of The Big Box Window. We're going to dig into all of those empty buildings that you see in your community, all those big box stores that are now leaving huge vacant lots in black communities all and communities in general all around the country. We're going to talk about that and see how it ties into everything else here, Georgia. All right. Well, that's all for On the Clock, but stick around for more on The Benjamin Dixon Show. Welcome back, everybody. Um, we want to jump right in with the time that we have before our first guest this morning. I want you to take a look at this clip. Um, it is a clip from Right Wing Watch. They are a, a fabulous organization. We spoke to the director of it, and they keep an eye on what's going on in Christian evangelical circles because it is part and parcel. It is a part of what uh, we see manifesting on the national stage in the form of the anti-vax movement, in the form of the big lie and the insistence that Donald Trump is still the actual president of the United States. The reason that is so strong 
is precisely because it is being taught in churches across the country. They managed to not only connect um, Afghanistan to the absurdity, but they're now turning around and creating the scenario where their congregants are the sheep to the slaughter. Take a look at this first clip. But I think that Trump clearly understood that Biden and the people who are controlling him are fools, number one. Mm -hmm. So you have foolish people who are going to do stupid things. And I think Trump planned on them doing a lot of stupid things. Trump set up the withdrawal from Afghanistan. I think that he planned on Biden botching that somehow. However, however he was going to botch it. I think Trump knew that Biden would make the wrong moves. I think the opportune time for the military to end this the charade would be after Biden has been removed by the 25th Amendment. Because then uh, if the military stepped in and intervened, uh, if they made the big reveal about devolution, they would not be removing Biden from office. It would not be a military coup because mm -hmm. Biden would have been removed from office by Kamala Harris. And if they step in after Biden is gone, but before Kamala is inaugurated, there is no commander in chief. You have an acting president, but she hasn't yet been sworn in, right? So if Kamala hasn't been sworn in, you, you don't really have a commander in chief. It isn't a military coup. Uh, I think that that would be the opportune time. I suspect that that's probably when the reveal is going to happen, that military will step in, announce what's going on, uh, potentially declare martial law in DC, make a bunch of arrests, uh, and then whatever happens with, with Trump returning to the Oval Office, whether it's a new election, whether they just inaugurate him, I don't really know. Now, that was the voice of QAnon conspiracy theorist Dave Hayes. And you heard him there claiming um, that Trump actually set up the withdrawal from Afghanistan with the intention of setting up Joe Biden so that Joe Biden can fail. Um, the absurdity of it all, but this is what is being taught on the online churches of the conspiracy theorist, conservative right-wing reactionary movement. I don't know that I need to actually unpack the ridiculousness of it as much as to warn everyone who's watching and listening that this is what they are being indoctrinated with on a daily, daily basis. And then on the weekends, they attend churches like the church of Pastor Greg Locke out of Tennessee. Take a listen to this clip as he discusses Paul Revere and somehow ties it all together with his deeply believed and deeply held conspiracy theory. Take a listen in. One of our favorite heroes in the chronicles of American history is a man by the name of Paul Revere. He's a revered statesman and they thought he was crazy. A lot of people don't understand. The history books won't tell you that when Paul Revere first mounted that horse to rescue the nation and rescue his town that night, he was actually going to his pastor's house to get a word of wisdom because he didn't know what to do in a certain decision. But he found out the redcoats were coming. He told everybody, light those candles, light those lanterns, light your torches, get the women and children out. And he got on that horse and he began to go through town. I'm sure they called him a conspiracy theorist. Probably called him a super spreader, called him a troublemaker, called him all manner of evil. You can imagine what their form of media said. But he went through town as fast as he could, passionately. The red coats are coming. The red coats are coming. The red coats are coming. And he successfully saved the nation because of it. But I'm going to make a promise to you tonight, and then we're going to sing a little bit. And here's the promise. Like Paul Revere of old, tonight I'm going to mount the old steed of freedom. <laughs> And I will tell everybody, a city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Let your light so therefore shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. And if it's the last ride I take, if it's the last sermon I preach, I'm going to let the world know, Jesus is coming! 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 Give him praise, church! Give him praise! <laughs> This represents the evolution of Greg Locke, who has only in this clip one reference to the world of conspiracy from which he hails. He said super spreader. This is his nod and his tip of his hat to that for 
faction of the right wing reactionary movement that promoted him to the international stage or rather the national stage. And so now this represents him trying to move out of the backwoods country Bama type of preaching onto the big stage. And so he has to have to minimize he has had to minimize the amount of conspiracy theories that he espouses in his sermons because now it gets him on a larger stage. This is not his church. This is not his pulpit. This is him moving up the ranks of the evangelical movement to bigger pulpits because what he preaches on Sunday aligns beautifully with the religion of conservative white evangelicalism. But Greg, we know who you are. You're a Bama who is making his hay off of conspiracy theories. And now you're trying to whitewash it in the name of Jesus. But we see you. Let's do this. Uh, we're gonna take a really quick break. DJ Exclusive is here. When we come back, we're gonna shift gears and we're gonna talk to our first guest and we're gonna discuss very briefly, or rather we're gonna discuss in depth what's going on in our communities. Everywhere I drive, in my city, and any city I've ever visited, there are so many vacant lots. And I'm wondering about all the promises these big corporations made to all of these cities. And now those corporations are gone and the cities have been stuck with the hot potato. DJ exclusive. Take it away. City David Wood bring me in as I'm drinking the damn coffee. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Y'all welcome. 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 Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned. Hope everyone is doing well. Happy Tuesday. Taco Tuesday. Good morning, everybody. In the city, I was raised on its edges. My pop work is life when it's gone. Blocks up on love in its center. If I can live here forever, think it'd be for the better. I love the weather, even though it's fog 24 7. I love the people. This is a city I met all my best friends, and I want to thank every break. I'm good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Seven, sweetheart. I see you, sister. Good morning, y'all. Tiger, what's going on, brother? See, I fell in love for the first time in Golden Gate Park. I saw my first rap show at Great American Hall. I used to beg my homies for Did you? Stilettos, what's going on, sister? I miss you. I feel like I ain't seen you in a month of Sundays. Good to see you. <laughs> yeah, hustler. Good morning, y'all. Good morning, brother Latif. What's going on? Yeah, man, y'all, please make sure y'all stay dry out there, okay? One source, good morning. Brandy Rubble, good morning to you. Six Dragon Daddy, what's going on? Roller Dragon, what's going on? <laughs> Susan, good morning. Brother Chuck Diesel. What's going on, brother? On and on. Good morning. Right, Church Ron Pew. Good morning to you. Good morning, mother and dad. Mother and father. Really and mother and father. Own, so <laughs> good morning, mama and daddy. Love y'all. Tyler Hackney, thank you for your super chat. Morning, Bubba. Good morning, brother Tyler. I book a flight to try to figure where my mind's at. A spot where I don't spend Miss Sophia, money, good morning. The pioneer, good morning. Quarter water. Good morning to you. Miss <laughs> Truth the Dragon, good, good morning. She said you're funny. I said no, I'm DP, good, good morning. Sunshine and birds. Environmental Cup House, good morning to you. Dev Miss Petal Benson, good morning. MBFHL Flaw Dragon, good morning. I'm hoping A, good morning. Anna, good morning, Anna. Evergreen, good morning. Love y'all, meaning good morning, y'all. Oh, it only goes. Good morning, Diso. Good morning to y'all. Captain Jack, as I appreciate it. Good morning to you. Goku, that's right. Good morning, brother. <laughs> Coffee house music. I like that. I think we'll turn it, okay? <laughs> Nicholas Rodriguez, good morning. Lisa Noel, good morning to y'all. All right, y'all, it's time for some more. So welcome back to the screen, my brother from Mother Mother. Benjamin Dixon, y'all. Good morning, brother. DJ Exclusive, how you doing this morning, brother? I'm good. I'm good, man. How you doing? I had a late start, though. Oh, my God. Hey, man. <laughs> listen, listen. We we all are. Listen, it, it's taken me every bit of six months to adjust to a morning show versus the evening show. So trust me when I tell you. Right. 
I understand. <laughs> Matter of fact, go enjoy that coffee, brother. We're going to jump into this interview. Uh, I'm excited to bring to the conversation Stacy Mitchell, co-director at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and author of the book Big Box Window. Um, Stacy, th- thank you so much for joining us. How are you this morning? Thank How you are so you much. Morning? It's nice to be with you. Uh, pleasure. I, I I had occasion to stumble on your Twitter thread where you like so succinctly in a couple of tweets summarize what I've been noticing in so many cities everywhere I travel here in the city of Atlanta. There are just so many vacant lots. And, and I see also on the other side, I see Amazon warehouses popping up everywhere. And I'm wondering if in the next 20 years, uh, these cities that are taking in all the new corporations are going to be saddled with the same empty vacant lot scenario that you uh, you spoke about on Twitter. Could you tell us about your work and kind of address it from the frame of that question? That's right. I mean, so many communities have been taken in by the promises of these big corporations, whether it's big box retailers like Walmart or more recently Amazon. You know, we're going to bring you lots of jobs. We're going to bring you lots of tax revenue. And you know, years later, after you know the growth of all these big box stores, what we see is lots of communities have just been hollowed out. They've lost their local businesses. Those big box stores haven't delivered on the promises, even if they're still operating. Um, you know, some of them have gone vacant. They haven't delivered the, the jobs that they promised, and they really haven't delivered the tax revenue. It turns out there's a whole hidden cost associated with these stores, and now many of those companies are demanding tax breaks and and you know lower property valuations on their uh, on their stores. And so it's really, um, you know, it's been a, it's been a bit of a swindle um, that mm. communities have gone down this route. And so, you know, part of the my my tweet thread was really to say, you know, we should be looking at this more holistically. And especially as we've got, you know, Amazon building warehouses, we should learn some lessons from the past. Yeah, I'm looking at um, I'm thinking of the city of South Fulton, um, which I had an occasion to meet a candidate for commissioner in that city. And we spoke specifically about this, right? We spoke about Mm -hmm. the promises that are made by corporations in the form of we're going to bring jobs. And so our local city council or whatever city council you're a part of, or you're in, they, they, they hear these corporations say, we're going to bring jobs. And then the mayor gets a chance to do a big presentation and say, we brought Amazon to our city, or in this case, your specific case is, you know, Lowe's in this photo that we're looking at, we brought Lowe's Mm -hmm. to our city, but now Lowe's is an empty vacant lot that is a liability to the city. And please tell us more about that swindle where the tax revenues that they thought we were going to get never really came. Yeah, that's right. You know, I mean, a lot of, you know, a lot of these big stores opened over community opposition. You know, you had local people saying, you know, we, we want to keep our local businesses. We want to have a healthy neighborhood business district. Um, And yet city officials were just drawn in by that tax argument. And so they okayed like a lot of this development, you know, some is okay, but they okayed a lot of it. And, Um, What we're seeing now is all of these companies are going around state after state, and what they're doing is systematically contesting their property valuations. They're saying, our buildings are worth half, a third, as much as you're saying they're worth, and we want to get a big cut in our property tax uh, bill. Mm. They're doing it under something that's called the dark store theory, which is you know, it, it's as nefarious as it sounds. They're essentially saying to cities, um, you should value our building as though it's empty, as though it's not a going concern with a bunch of sales and revenue going on in the building, but instead you should treat it as though it's like a decrepit, vacant building and that should be the value. Um, and they're getting away with it in a lot of states, though there is now some pushback and there's some legislation that maybe could stop them. But the end result for cities is that they um, have often seen local businesses disappear, which has gotten rid of property tax revenue that was coming in from those businesses. They've seen higher costs for services for these stores. These stores generate a lot of police calls, a lot of road maintenance. And then now those stores themselves are slashing their property tax payments. So the, the end result is that this is these, these businesses are really hurting cities financially in a significant way. Mm. And you're and you're telling me, I want to make sure I heard correctly. You said that there's an argument that's being made by these corporations that we should value their decrepit, broken down blight on our cities that are the empty parking lots of their big boxes. Yeah, I mean, they're actually saying that those stores that are in operation 
stores that are doing tens of millions of dollars of business every year should be valued as though they're vacant. And the argument that they're making oh. is that these are single purpose buildings that if Walmart leaves the building, it's got no other use and therefore it has no value, which is of course exactly the opposite of what they told cities gotcha. 10 years ago when they wanted to build. They were like, oh, this is gonna be the greatest thing and we're gonna add all this you know, tax gotcha. base and so on. Okay. And now they're saying we're, we're, we're worthless. And in fact, we've got empty buildings all over the country so you can see that we're really worthless and that nobody wants to occupy these buildings. <laughs> So it's even right. worse than I thought. <laughs> they're, yeah, they're exactly. To prove the and point. it's a scandal, you know. I mean, mm. there are there are towns they're doing this in Michigan. They started doing it here in Maine. They've done it all over the Midwest, and they have gotten uh, big, big tax uh, cuts. And in some cases, the state there's usually a, a state tax board that this goes through. The state tax board has actually made the local city or town write the company a check for back taxes, like basically taxes wow. they had paid in previous years. Now you've got a wow. struggling city government, and then they're having to cut services, libraries, schools, everything else is having to pay the price so that Walmart can walk out with a big check uh, for taxes that it paid in previous years. Mm. In addition to the public subsidizing of um, these corporations in the form of uh, food stamps, um, any type of assistance because these corporations aren't necessarily paying their workers a living wage. So not only are we getting stuck with the bag or with the hot potato, I seems to be my <laughs> yeah. phrase for today, uh, as cities, because they're skipping town, proving a point that we have to keep them. It, it is so convoluted and nefarious. I want to just hold the pin there and ask you about some cities, some states that got it right. You said Vermont is a state that got it right. Tell us about that. Yeah, Vermont um, has a law, uh, it's called Act 250, um, and it's, it's a statewide law, it's a land use law, and it essentially says if you want to build something large, whether it's a big commercial development, big housing development, then there has to be an analysis about whether the costs of that, you know, whether the benefits of it are going to outweigh the costs. Like they do, an, they really do the math, like how is this going to play out over time? And you know, what is it gonna generate in terms of jobs, revenue, good economic activity? And then what are gonna be the costs? Are we gonna lose you know, businesses in other parts of the community? Are they gonna go out? Are we gonna lose tax revenue? How much is this gonna cost in services? I mean, they do a full scale analysis and they do it at the regional level. So mm. it's not just about the host community, but all of the surrounding communities also participate in that. And it's about the impact that it might have on, on them as well. And because of that, you know, what you've seen in Vermont and there are a few other places that have similar policies, you know, people get the full picture. Like in the case of big box retail, you know, back in the 90s, 2000, when those retailers were building lots of stores, Vermont was actually doing the analysis. And in many cases mm -hmm. coming back and saying, you know what, this is actually going to cost more. And, and this isn't going to deliver the promises that these companies are making. And when people saw that information, clearly what they then did was say no to those stores. So today, you know, Vermont has far fewer big box stores. It's it's an option, you know, there's, there's you know, there are five Walmarts in the state and it's a, an available option for people, but it's not the level of saturation that you see everywhere else. Um, and in turn, Vermont has more small businesses per capita than any other state. So they've really avoided the big box swindle and had a more diverse uh, and productive local economy as a result. Could you talk about our level of complicity as individuals with mm. uh, our level of consumerism and our incessant need to buy widgets? How are we complicit with this type of life? Yeah, you know, it's on the one hand, I think that people it's, it's it is really worth thinking about like where your dollars go. And, you know, even that exercise is a great way to like learn about um, you know, sort of how our economy works or doesn't work, right, is to just pay attention. Um, and there are, in, in many places, you know, there are great local businesses that give back that are good employers that need your dollars. And I would just encourage people to, you know, sort of seek out those businesses and support them because they really do need you. Um, on the other hand, I would also say that I think we need to see this as a product of, of, of public policy, that we have really, we have, we have, implemented policies at the local, state, and federal level that have favored and encouraged the consolidation of economic power by these big companies, whether it's Amazon or Walmart. We've said, 
you know, you don't have to pay federal taxes. We, we've created all sorts of loopholes that only work for big business. We've created land use policies that favor this kind of development. I mean, the list goes on and on of ways in which we have actively encouraged their growth and undermined more community-based alternatives through public policy. And ultimately it's public policy that's gonna change this. And so on the one hand, I want people to be mindful of, of where they're shopping and spending and that's important, but I also really feel like it's our citizen muscle that's the most mm. powerful muscle. And we need yes. to like learn how to use that and learn how to use policy to structure the economy in ways that actually work for people. Mm, absolutely. One final question for you uh, with the time that we have left. In your in your book or in your research, have you found a larger concentration of empty big box stores in any particular subgroup? And I guess I could point, I don't mm. see a lot of empty stores in wealthy neighborhoods. And right. I see a lot of empty stores in black neighborhoods. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, what you see with these big chains, and, and it's not just the you know sort of big boxes like Walmart, but it's also the, the pharmacy chains, CVS and Walgreens. You know, all of these these chain companies is, you know, during flush times they will expand and they will push the envelope. But then when they decide to close stores, where is it that they close? It's always communities of color, low income communities that they pull out of. They have very little commitment um, to communities in general, but you know, particularly to to communities of color. Um, and there is a just sort of willingness to mistreat people um, mm. that you know, that you see in terms of their development patterns. And it it just really comes back, I think, again to well, how is it that we build businesses and institutions that are really rooted in community and owned by people in the community, and therefore have a vested interest in the long term interests of the community, you know, and for too long, we've been on this like bigger is better, you know, yeah. uh, kind of uh, approach. And, and the reason my organization, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance exists is to sort of question that and say, what would it look like if we did economic development in a different way that was really about um, uh, something that's more community based and community rooted? Mm. Um, and it sounds like Vermont might have a model. It sounds like uh, businesses shouldn't come from the top down any more than government should come from the top down, but should come from the bottom up, from a local level up. Stacy, thank you so much for, for joining us and all the work that you're doing. The title of the book is Big Box Swindle. Uh, Stacy Mitchell, co-director at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, appreciate it. When we come back, like it or not, but first, DJ exclusive. Y'all, what made the tomato blush? It's all the salad dressing? I can't deal with you, DJ. I'm going to take my own break. It's all the salad dressing. I don't know where these people come up with this stuff at. Right? <laughs> oh, good morning again, y'all. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned, all right? Environmental Coffee House, right? Church, wrong pew. Yeah, good morning, y'all. <laughs> Goku, thank you for the tomatoes, brother. I appreciate it. Other boys with infinite content. Good morning. <laughs> Y'all can't take me and my dad jokes, okay? I can't take me and my dad jokes either. <laughs> oh, my gosh. My God, today. <laughs> All right, y'all. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned. But while we get this break ready, get everything situated and turned over, let's go ahead and get our... Switch in YouTube and all those other people subscribe. <laughs> new subscribers ran off real quick, all right? Uh, let me see. Let me get the music lowered here. All right, y'all. All right. New Patreon, new patrons, and new Twitch subscribers today. Nicole L. Shout out Nicole, Sean F., Carrie M., Mary C., Duval H, like Lil Duval, no? Okay, Duval H, DJ, like DJ exclusive? No, DJ, shout out to DJ, man. Our new Twitch subscribers, we have Chrysanthemum. <laughs> I don't know if I can read that one. <laughs> uh, we have Chrysanthemum, and we have Bout to Bus. 
<laughs> subscribe with Prime. <laughs> Silhouette Alphabet. We have a 420 Kitty Dragon. <laughs> Resubscribe these names. Bit, <laughs> brick throwing Kami. <laughs> 342. <laughs> The Chicken Fried Dragon resubscribe. We have Murderino Dragon. Donut Space resubscribe. We have the Chicken Fried Dragon who gifted a subscription to Danielle Labiqua. And Sammy Lynn, the Kind Dragon, gifted a subscription to Why So Dankness. JNLE, also 1981, also gifted the subscriptions to uh, Marcus for Left Flank Vets as well, too, man. Thank y'all so much for the three subscribes, man, and new patron members. We greatly appreciate y'all. Love y'all the best to death, man. Y'all the best. Also, Utter Bullsmith says we need to invest and reinvest in manufacturing in this country and stop all of this globalization. China is quickly surpassing us. <laughs> quickly surpassing us. Amen to that. Brenda Johnson says, I worked with a citizens group years ago to keep Walmart out of our community and was successful. This is one of the many reasons why. Thank you for that, Brenda Johnson. Thank you again, other boys, man. If you have a super chat that you're going to drop, read it off on the air as well, too. We greatly appreciate you. Tyler Hackner said, Bubba, you and your dad jokes are never ending. Never ending. Because if I run out of the 150 that I got there, there are probably about 500 more I can find on the internet. <laughs> So we gonna have dad jokes for days. <laughs> Love y'all mean it, okay? Just don't throw tomatoes at me in real life when y'all see me, all right? I greatly appreciate it. <laughs> Make sure that y'all stay tuned, man. Like it or not, it's starting up soon. I forgot that our sister from another mister won't be with us today. Prayers up for Rebecca. She's got an important doctor's appointment today. So prayers up for uh, Sister Rebecca. Make sure everything goes good. All right, y'all. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned. We got some more coming up. All right. Keep it locked right here. The Benjamin Dixon Show. What it took to make you like a blossom of a tree or the color of a tree. Mark S. I think I might change that to my name. Mark S. said, we need a marinated neck bone sandwich dragon. <laughs> <laughs> Tiger, what's your uh, joke, mind. Tiger? What's going on? What you got? Darling, you are all I want for sure. Darling, you give me everything. Mara Sharice, good morning, Mara. KFZ, good morning. <laughs> yeah, girl. You know I miss you. KFZ, you're annoying as hell, bro. Good morning, brother KFZ. Good morning to you. <laughs> Blue Daddy, good morning. Slide talking, girl, you're walking circles <laughs> through my mind. <laughs> All right, y'all. This is from Tiger. Tiger says, did you know you can't run in a camping ground? You can only run. It's past tense. Get it? Past tense. T-E-N-T-S. <laughs> And I said, darling, darling, now y'all blame Tiger for that one, y'all. <laughs> I said, darling, darling, you know uh, Tiger, that was a good one. That was a good one. That darling, was a good one. I appreciate that one. <laughs> ooh, 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 ooh. Oh my yeah, gosh. Y'all make sure y'all stay you know tuned. Actually, baby, all right, I think I'm going to have a quick second. Y'all, yesterday, you know, I you know played I the new song you. by Barca. I think that's the name, right, uh, David, if I'm not mistaken? Um, and it sounded really good. So I had somebody reach out to me yesterday and ask to play a song that they requested. They're independent artists here in Atlanta. And I listened to it. And when I tell you that the song is pretty much a pop. So I said I'll make sure I play it on the air. Independent artists, man, so make sure that y'all go support. His name is Jay Nolan. We'll play the song and I'll let you know where you can get the song from and go follow and listen along. All right, here we go. His song is called Splash. Going bad on him. I be running up a check and do the dash on him. They were sleeping on the kid and I passed all of them. I was waiting in the water and I splash on him. Like, get a ball, splash. Hit the frog, splash. White wall, splash. 
Jackie John, splash. Fuck all the drama, just me and my partners be grinding to fill up the bag. Add up the comments, she look at the diamonds, the mama gon' rob the splash. Mission to fill in the blanks, permission to fill up the bank. Let's go. Gassing on niggas, I guess I should fill up the tank. The champion and tip through the ranks. Let's Driving go. hits like golden gloves. Uh-huh. Bang head with the shoulder shrug. Yeah. May weather boy, I'm undefeated. I'm a competition, I just pull the plug. Pull the Light a candle for the ops. Uh-huh. Got me pulling all the stops. Niggas see me in they dread. Uh-huh. Made me think of going locks. <laughs> I'm just creeping through your block. See all the holes in your strategy. I break it down like some crocs. In your tent like some jack in the box. Got your chick in my spot. She want apples to rock. I'm a bad boy. I just crashed for yeah. it. I don't pay attention to the dash. I begin to paint, then I crash, boys. Y'all just act hard, get your sad card. I'm a Jaguar. Inspiration for the generation, like the Black Panther. On my job, I just spread my gift, do it every year. Some secret Santa. Sweet home, no Alabama. On the floor, like David Banner. Pinky ring on Super Bowl, see me high stepping like Deion Sanders. Rule boy, and better mind your matters. I've been watching y'all about to change the channel. Got a chick waiting on speed dial, and she got a drop like Louisiana. Like, oh. Going bad on them. I said he's running up a check and do the dash on them. They were sleeping on the kid and I passed all of them. I was waiting in the water, now I splash on them. Splash like Cannonball, splash. Hit the frog, splash. White wall, splash. Jackie jump, splash. Fuck up the drama, just me and my partners be grinding to fill up the bag. And I'm she look at the diamonds, the mama gon' rob with the splash. So many kids with that damn believe. I set the goal up and then achieve. Family get business like Genevieve. About to set up a show out in Tel Aviv. Shout out your West, you can't remember me. Got my cash in the safe like the All right, Z. y'all. That is Jay Nolan. Artist is Jay Nolan. Y'all can follow him on Instagram. Real Jay Nolan. Website, Real Jay Nolan. And on YouTube, Jay Nolan. Y'all make sure y'all check the brother out, man. He is from uh, the city of Atlanta. And he sent me another song as well, too, that I got to make sure that I get played. But when I tell you, uh, yeah, he sent this to me. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's good, man. That's a yes. pop, man. It is. It's straight from Atlanta. I was like, straight oh, I appreciate that. So if y'all do go to his website, if y'all Instagram, tell me that DJ exclusive sent, him, sent you, okay? Yeah. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. No, James, we've been talking about this for a minute, man. Um, when we first when we first started putting the morning show together um, uh, and started planning and designing it, we were like, man, there's so many talented, independent artists out here. And truth be told, both of us obviously come from the music background. Right. Um, so uh, it, it's really dope to hear that cut and uh, and to see that. Bring more of that. Long story short. Let's okay. do more of that. I like hey, that. real quick, man. You want to hear a joke about construction? <laughs> I don't think I have a choice, do I? <laughs> no, I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> David, I don't know what clip you have. <laughs> Um, but you know what? Yes, we do need to do this properly, even though our sister from another mister is not here. <laughs> Dave, uh, James, bring us in properly. Okay, you want to do the are we, are we the, rolling? We're gonna run the intro. Okay, okay, run it, David. Okay, <laughs> like it or not, with Benjamin Dixon starts now. Good morning, good morning, good morning. <laughs> good morning and welcome to Like It or Not, where we're free to tell the truth. And not care who doesn't like it. What do you call a fake noodle? I, I don't I I I'm, I'm I don't know, James. An imposter. <laughs> David <laughs> He didn't get it, David. He didn't get it. <laughs> Good morning, Ben. How you doing, brother? <laughs> I'm good, man. I'm good. I love I love the fact that we can go from imperialism and colonialism. <laughs> <laughs> to just straight tomfoolery. Man. Tomfoolery. Hey. Of dad jokes. You gotta be able to do it. You gotta be able to uh <laughs> switch the minds real easy. <laughs> Hey, this is what they asked on all those applications. They said you, you had to be uh, able to perform well under pressure. And um, what what is the second one where you're supposed to handle multiple tasks at one time, and switch between high tasks, you know, all that stuff. They want us to be high performing. Well, right. there's nothing more high performing than going from Afghanistan to dad jokes within a span of an hour and a half. Uh-huh. Basically. Yep. 
<laughs> They'll loosen you up a little bit because they're so terrible. You ain't got no choice but to laugh and be like, what the hell was that? <laughs> and see, James, if you're not here on the screen, my mind naturally goes to the situation in the world being so ter terrible that we have no choice but to laugh. So uh -huh. we have a, like, a nice dichotomy on the screen here. I right, that's, exactly. That's <laughs> that said, behind the scenes is the part of um, this dialectic that we're doing, and that is David. He is uh, here in the stead of our homeboy, uh, Dwayne, over there at Done Right Media, who helps us look as amazing as we do. Shout out to everyone who makes this possible, and shout out to our sister from another Mr. Rebecca Azor, who is not here this morning because, well, she's taking time for herself because she has put in a lot of work um, doing her part for Haiti. And I just have to pause and reflect on the fact that the pictures and the videos that she has shared with us that mm -hmm. we are compiling so that you can see what your dollars did. I mean, the money that you donated absolutely went straight to Haiti because we have video and footage of uh, and photos of Rebecca's brother actually dropping off what you, the supporter, helped us purchase yes. through Rebecca. So thank you, audience. And James, you you got to see the pictures, too. Yeah, absolutely. When I tell you, uh, amazing to see. So shout out to Rebecca and her brother, man, just doing the damn thing. Greatly appreciated seeing it. Um, it was awesome. Yeah, Real awesome. yeah. No, it's awesome. And um, and and shout out to the people of Haiti who have endured and overcome tragedy after tragedy. But you guys are uh, all of you. Uh, you are resilient people. And uh, as evidenced by the fact that we have uh, the Haitian princess on this show. Uh, Rebecca Zor, who's taking the morning <laughs> off. That said, it's just you and me, James. You right. think we can handle it? Can you? Can we? Can we? <laughs> I think we'll be okay. <laughs> I think I think we Wildcats can handle it without a rattler right. on the screen with us. I don't oh, think absolutely. I think we. So, David, um, I know I can look at the sheet of paper and I can I can find out exactly what we're getting ready to watch. But I'd like the audience to experience it the same way we experience it because a lot of times we don't have any idea what David is about to play. Right. <laughs> so play that funky clip for me, white man. <laughs> did this press conference a couple of weeks ago saying that white supremacy was the biggest threat to our nation okay turn on any tv channel i don't see white supremacists taking <laughs> over afghanistan no do you no i've okay. never met a white supremacist in 52 years of living here and I'm, i've met everybody yeah you know i've met the uh, head of the nation of islam i've met every wacko in the world flat earth people i've never met anyone who said you know i'm a, i'm just a white supremacist yeah this is just and may, i'm sure they exist every variety of weirdo exists i've it's, never it's met their, one of them I, I call it their golden unicorn okay yeah. because it, it's the invisible monster that they can blame everything on yes and then point to every white person out there and say oh you're a white supremacist <laughs> so did he change his set because that set is given very much white supremacy <laughs> I'm sorry to the listening audience who can't see but he's talking about Tucker Carlson the second voice you heard in the clip was that of Tucker Carlson and he is on his Ooh. secondary set Tucker Carlson is so White supremacy is so successful in this country that the 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 lead propagandist for white supremacy, Tucker Carlson, um, hmm. is able to have two shows, not one, um, both on Fox's networks. One that looks and gives the appearance of, uh, well, Fox News and the flashing lights and the glamorous looks of Manhattan, where their studios are. And this second show, James, to your point, is the log cabin kind of look where he's trying to make it seem like he's really connected to the common man. And there he's talking to uh, this is the same guy. We had a, another clip from him in the first uh, on the first segment, if, if, let me let me scroll up. That was PA congressional candidate Teddy Daniels, uh, the same guy who put air quotes around pandemic in discussion of wow. the vaccine and the mask mandates. Um, so there's a lot going on in this clip. The the biggest uh, and the most glaring elephant in the room is that, of course, two white supremacists could not see themselves <laughs> like like, yep. come on, man. It's not rocket science. I've never seen a white supremacist because you are one. <laughs> right. Tell me. <laughs> Absolutely. And that makes no sense at all. You've never seen a white supremacist on TV? Oh, yeah, you have. You saw one for the last four years, uh, four years ago. So what the hell are you talking about? Because I know I saw one. I saw a few, you know, Karen's. Cop Come killers. on, man. I mean, Come not on. cop killers, but uh, killer cops. Black, killer, killer killer cops. Killer Thank cops. you. Reverse that. Killer cops. Flip I don't know what they talking about. So, yeah. yeah. And then this yeah. somebody said that 
This bald headed guy looks like a bleach shrimp. <laughs> facts. Big facts. And Tucker, 52 years old? Oh, man. Look at white supremacy would do to your skin. Ugh. Jesus. Moisturize yourself in some liberation, brother. Uh, <laughs> um, run the next clip, David. Let's just keep us on our toes. What's, what you got next? Him is a terrible governor. Not saying he's a terrible person, maybe a great person. But look at the state he leads. It's gotten demonstrably, visibly worse by every measure during the years he has led it. You'd think even leaders of the Democratic Party, his party would be very happy that he could be leaving. But they're not. They're doing everything they can to keep him in office. They're going so far as to endorse the job he's doing, if you can imagine. They're not blind. They see what he's done. Joe Biden and Kamala Harris are now set to campaign against the recall. No more democracy for you. You got to wonder, will the state survive this? Will there be a free and fair election? Harmeet Dillon is the co-chair of the Republican National Lawyers Association. California does not get the credit it deserves for the corruption that's endemic there. It's a one-party state, and they act like it. Of course I'm concerned, Tucker. I'm involved in election integrity efforts throughout the United States, and I'm also a member of the Republican National Committee. We are monitoring things. Just a couple of hours ago, I filed a lawsuit to intervene in a challenge to the constitutionality of the recall statute, because frankly, I don't trust the Secretary of State or the Attorney General. We are going to be jumping on every pot potential opportunity to do that and fight back against the Democrats. Of course, they are uh, playing fast and loose. We've seen some very alarming scenes of 300 ballots uh, bundled together in the car of a person with a gun and some drugs. Ballots have already been found in trash cans. Really? Photographs have been taken of them. I've got people who have taken videos and said, look what I'm finding here. One pastor I know was driving down the street, saw some documents on the side of the highway that he thought looked somewhat important. He grabbed them. They were opened. He recognized them immediately. They were ballots regarding this special recall election. Every one of those ballots said yes. Newsom should be removed. And the second question on the ballot was, who do you want to replace him with? And these were Larry Elder voters. It's already sure. started. That's why we documented it. Because, of course, when you say these things, everybody says, no, that's not true. OK, we got a lot going on in that clip, and it is discussing the recall election efforts that are happening in California. But it also intersects very nicely with the broader conversation about the extent to which Republicans and conservatives will go to snatch democracy hmm. from the hands of black people, particularly. Joining us now is friend of the show and co-founder of Black Voters Matter, one of the baddest brothers in um, the fight against this onslaught of white supremacy against democracy. Cliff Albright, how are you this morning, brother? Hey, man, I'm doing good. I was glad to see you. It is good to see you, man. And um, we've talked about this on occasion, man. Like, I, I really would like for you to help contextualize what we see going on in California into the mm -hmm. broader California <laughs> into the broader conversation <laughs> it's that kind of morning <laughs> into the broader <laughs> conversation about voting rights and the attacks of the conservatives on voting rights across the country. Yeah. I mean, it's basically just more of the same, like you, like you were saying, I mean, here you got in, in that clip, you hear them talking already about, you know, so-called ballots being thrown away and, and all this evidence of, of rampant fraud. Like, where have we heard this before, right? Like, these are the same things that, that Trump said before his election because he knew he was going to lose and because he was trying to set up the big lie. These are the same things that they're doing now in California to, uh, to cover up the fact they are going to lose this, this attempt. And no matter what, again, it just... Um, it just reaffirms and strengthens the big lie because no matter what happens with the actual election, what we know is that they're going to try to use uh, these false claims, these false stories about ballots being thrown out the same way they're going to use the, the, the false stories about the Arizona uh, frauded and, and checking right. for bamboo, bamboo uh, uh, right. you know, uh, ballots. traces within the, yeah. the ballots and all of that <laughs> stuff. I mean, no matter what, they're going to use the hysteria that they create around the big lie to then be a further rationalization for all of the voter suppression that they're doing all across the country. I, I got a pretty hefty task for us this morning. I want us to juxtapose, if you would, <laughs> voter suppression with 
COVID-19 and the anti-mask, anti-vax reactionary movement that is also running parallel to the efforts to um, uh, undermine our right to vote. Help us to draw any parallels that you see between um, that, that duality inside of the conservative movement, which is the conspiracy theory that is pushing people to die. Conservative radio hosts, they're believing their lives so much that they are dying from COVID-19, but it's almost like the same lies that they're believing about voting. Yeah, I mean, like, you, you, you're right. The, the Venn diagram of the people that believe in the big lie and the people that are taking ivermectin, you know, and, and talking about vaccination conspiracies, that Venn diagram is a perfect circle. And I'll give you another, I'll give you another circle to throw on top of it. Cause this is something I didn't even know of until I saw some stuff that, that you and David had tweeted out. So, so now they got a conspiracy about the doggone hurricane that, that the hurricane is, is a conspiracy and, and it's just made up and, and you got people attacking, attacking newscasters who are out reporting right. on it, talking about, Ooh, you better be reporting it. Right. You know, stop making up stuff. We're making up a hurricane now. Is that, like that's and so wow. that that circle of the people that believe that fits right on top of those other two circles in terms of COVID and the election fraud. <laughs> it's crazy. Like what? What? Like what is going? People are taking cow de horse de work. Like what? What is going on here? But this just shows the the lengths oh that you go when you when you gotta believe in a notion like white supremacy, it'll it'll cause you to believe in just about any conspiracy anything. theory, mm -hmm. anything that'll 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 reinforce your belief system, no matter how crazy and unrighteous that belief system is. It'll it, even to the point of it costing your life. That's mm. that's how much that's how deep. Um, this this white supremacy is and it's, it's deeply rooted in the fabric of this of this country. You're talking yeah. about something when when white folks had nothing else in this country, when poor white folks had nothing else in this country, they mm. had the notion of at least I ain't them other folk. And that belief when 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 you cling to it, then mm. it'll force you to hold on to it in spite of all reality. It'll force you to believe in notions of white supremacy. And, and inferior white intellect, even when everything we see betrays that notion, right? And so, uh, this supremacy that's, that's, that's ain't so supreme, with. brother. This this white supremacy ain't so supreme. If at you look all. at the the sum total of their equation, the apex, you, the apotheosis of white supremacy is they're <laughs> they're crapping themselves with dewormer, right? <laughs> right. right. I like our eyes, yeah. brother. I like our eyes, um, that's right. David. Uh, we we want to run this clip. Uh, Cliff, you sent over a clip that you want us to take a look at. I also want people to see that clip that you're talking about um, from MSNBC. It was two black men. One was in the anchor seat. One mm -hmm. was out reporting on the hurricane and some madman, uh, white man drove up mm -hmm. and got into his face and he it should be grateful that he did not get a two piece snack. That said, let's run the clip, uh, the clip of um, clip that you brought and let's discuss it. A little bit about this earlier today and I'm gonna I'm I'm a be brief with this but it's really important I talked about early today if y'all were out there today about how on this day when most people are talking about I have a dream that on this day and not just this day but really for weeks my meditations have been on not what Dr. King said and I have a dream but what he wrote mm. months earlier when he was sitting in a Birmingham jail yes Yes. And when he wrote that letter from Birmingham yes. jail, what he did was he did an entire dissertation on the essence and the necessity of nonviolent civil disobedience. And he talked about a lot of things in, in, in his letter. And I know many of y'all out here have read it and studied it. But he talked about a lot of things. He talked about this issue of the, of the white moderates. We know <laughs> a few white moderates nowadays that are getting in the way, right? Uh -oh. Uh -oh. But he talked about his disappointment in the, in, the, in, in, in the white moderates. He talked about his disappointment in the clergy, and, and not just the white clergy, but black, black clergy. clergy as well. You know, but he talked about a lot of things in this letter. He talked about this issue of, of being an extremist and how people accused him of being an extremist. And his response to them was, that's okay. You know, at first I was offended, but then I reflected. And I said, you know what? It's okay to be extreme, because at the end of the day, it wasn't Jesus. Mm. Extremists for love. Mm. 
right? Come on, and somebody. So I'm okay with being an extremist if I can be an extremist in the spirit of moving uh, justice and righteousness forward versus being an extremist in the, in, the, in, the, in the interest of trying to perpetuate injustice. It's not that bad to be extreme. In fact, you got to be extreme, especially if you're going to do what? If you're going to make some good trouble. Right. Hmm. Uh, you got uh, to be a little extreme uh, if you're going to make some good trouble. Huh. Ain't, ain't no way to really make good trouble if you're not willing to be extreme. Right? right? John Lewis was being extreme when he got on a bus traveling across the South to challenge the laws. You got to be a little extreme to make good trouble. Yes. You got to be a little extreme. Now, brother, on, um, <laughs> you better preach. <laughs> Now, not not to not to not to take the attention away from the very substance of what you're saying, because it is rich. But, brother, you better preach. Hello, somebody. Now, that said, man, uh, I grappled with Dr. King, my father in his office. When I was a little boy, he had a book of sermons and writings of Dr. King. And, man, I was Talk grappling with. Yeah. Uh, oh, 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 see that. See. Wow. You, yeah. That that threw me off. That was uh, Cliff's voice. <laughs> but it was in the video. <laughs> <laughs> Coming back to the point of the dialectic that Dr. King espoused in that letter, please talk about this clip, the necessity of, of what white supremacy would always call anything that we do extreme. But yet we have to do whatever is necessary to make good trouble. Brother Cliff, help us understand what you were feeling in this moment. Mm -hmm. no, you're, 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 oh, there you go. Oh. <laughs> there we go. We got you now. Okay. It's interesting when you you know you talk about you know your your studies of King and being introduced by by your father because when I when I first moved down to Selma I moved to Selma in ninety eight you know I would I, I wouldn't I consider born myself a were you were, I didn't know that yeah okay. I was born yeah, in Selma yeah, wow. I, I'm I'm old, um, I'm I'm old enough to be to still have Negro on my birth certificate. <laughs> Man, thank no, you, you ain't you so Get out of here. I, I swear, I, on, on, on God, ask my mama. But go ahead, Cliff. You was, <laughs> yours mine says right. black. Mine says black. And I was born like like 40 minutes away from you. Look. Oh, my God. Yeah, yeah, two years, years before. Selma. Look at the difference of Selma. But you moved, Cliff, to Selma in 98. That's right. That's right. And and and, and having lived there, I, I believe you when you say that, to you, that you've got Negro <laughs> on, your, on your birth certificate. Um, I do. But... <laughs> But uh, and, and 40, 40 miles from Selma is is a significant difference because you you could be in the city of Montgomery in in, in forty miles from from Selma and, and there's a there's a difference there. But yes. anyway, but the <laughs> but the point is being that you know I wasn't really a fan. You know, um, you know I wasn't. You know, I I, I was born, you know, in the Malcolm School, um, mm. and, and truth be told, still am right. Mm. Um, but I developed a deep respect for Dr. King, the more that I studied his words, not the words that they would feed us on, you know, his birthday every year and in the McDonald's commercials, you mm -hmm. know, where they would just limit it to one speech. But, you know, I started to study the speech when he came out against Vietnam. I started to study his, where do we go from here speech in 1967, where he says that, you know, at some point we can't just look at the society and figure out how to better take care of beggars. That's the word he used was beggars, but we got to question a society that systemically create beggars, right? You know, I started looking at, at some of his other rights. You know, I started to study the efforts at the poor people's campaign. And part of that study was taking a close look at the letter from Birmingham jail, one of the most underrated pieces of writing, I believe, in U.S. history, the way that he spells out the rationale for um, nonviolent civil civil disobedience. And he addresses all those issues that I mentioned in there. And so right now, you know, we're at a moment where we have got to match our actions with the nature of the thing that we are trying to fight against or fight for, right? In other words, when you're fighting against white supremacy or take, take a step back, you, you can't be going after a major opponent in the form of a Goliath, right? And not be willing to use, like Dr. King said, extreme uh, tactics, right? The, the, the bigger your opponent is, the more deeply entrenched it is, then the deeper you gotta go. You know, the flip side is also true. If you're just going after a small opponent, you ain't you ain't got to go nuclear, right? You got you to <laughs> match, you gotta match your tactics to the nature of what it is that you're fighting against. Right now, we're fighting against 
voter suppression, which is as old as America itself. America right. was founded on voter suppression. Only white men with property, you know, could, could vote. Mm. It was founded on voter suppression. Uh, D.C., the lack of D.C. statehood and D.C. voting rights is as right. old as the country itself. You know, the filibuster is not a recent creation that's been used mm. against voting rights and civil rights. It's been used against civil rights since 1874 and repeatedly throughout the 1900s to block everything from voting rights to civil rights to, to anti-lynching legislation. So when you're going up against something that is that deeply rooted in the nature and the fabric of this country and deeply connected to white supremacy, we've got to at least be willing to be as confrontational, as extreme, if you will, as they as we were in the 50s and 60s with the civil rights movement. It's going to take that level of direct action and civil disobedience. It's going to take being in the streets and locking arms and blocking some doors and blocking some intersections. It's going to take at least that much in order to end this Jim Crow archaic filibuster that is blocking progress for us for so many years. And not just on voting rights, it's blocking progress on, on, on all the rest of the agenda that we want to police violence and, 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 uh, you know, climate change and immigration and all in a living wage, we've got to end this filibuster, but to do so, we've got to be willing to use some tactics beyond the phone calls and the text messages. All that is nice. Social media tweets, all that is good, but we're going to have to hit these streets. That's a right lot now. harder than what we've been hitting, um, and it's happening. You know, we've we've had four members of the Congressional Black Caucus get arrested with us over the past month and a half, and so we've got you got Cory Bush who was willing to be extreme in order to make that's right. trade. That's right. Sitting on sleeping on the steps of the Capitol is a little mm. extreme, and that's what you got to do when you're trying to save 11 million people from being evicted. That's what we're gonna have to do during the next weeks um, as we we get into this critical phase of this battle on voting rights, and as we. Uh, push to end the filibuster yeah mm. cliff how much time you got man because you know i get in these conversations and i just be ignoring the clock and, and people be like ben i gotta <laughs> call i gotta get off the show how much time you got bro <laughs> Man, I can, I, I, I can sit and talk to y'all all day you know i'm a, I'm a, I'm a little upset Rebecca ain't around, but that's all right. Yeah, you know? right. Yeah. <laughs> Shout out to Rebecca. Nah, man. I, people be like, we get in these conversations, man, and I honestly like, I get so lost in the conversations because they're necessary. Because, because one of the parts of this, man, that 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 I wanted to ask you about before you got out of here, brother, is is that that plight of survivors of slavery, um, yeah. and and properly yeah. being able to understand who we. Because when you say Cory Bush. And you talk about her sleeping on the steps of the Capitol. I actually extrapolate a little higher and I say, I see her sleeping on the steps of the Capitol of the greatest empire in the history of the known mm. universe. Mm. You know, and so when we consider our perspective, the perspective from that, you know, I don't know, you know, not 30,000 foot perspective, but a, a universal perspective. What people like Sister Cori Bush um, and, and Nina Turner and and so many black people who are deeply steeped in the liberation tradition are doing is galactic man like like what you're doing and what you're doing traveling this country and what john lewis did speaking truth to power, all the way back to our ancestors i'm thinking about frederick Douglass. you know i've been hanging around brother mac a little bit so i got a little bit more history in me than normal <laughs> before and every time i think about the history of black folks in this country man what kind of nerve we have had to have to stare the biggest and greatest empire in the history of the known universe in the mm. face and say, let our people go. Talk about that for me. Man. Mm. man, you know, as you were talking, I was thinking about Sister Maya Angelou, you know, and, and, and still I rise, right? We should not even still be standing. You know, we should we should not even be in existence. Mm. When you think about everything that 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 we've been through, not just not just the horrors of the middle passage, the Mafia, not just the horrors of slavery, of of Jim Crow of the race riots back when race riots um, um, were actually white folks rioting, right? And, and, and killing and murdering and, and plundering and lynching. You know, we, we, we shouldn't still be standing when you think mm. about the ways our neighborhoods have been devastated um, by everything from, from urban renewal, which, you know, they said back in the day was really Negro removal, you know, and, <laughs> and, 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 and when we look at environmental racism, when we look at the healthcare crisis, when we look at all these issues, when we look at how our communities 
are more susceptible to these natural disasters as we sit here on the anniversary um, a couple of days ago of Katrina, and now we're facing another disaster that's plaguing our communities and our loved ones down in Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, we think, we think, by what nerve, you know, what, what manner of people are we? <laughs> we are even still standing and then Come having on. the audacity to, to, to continue to shape this country and make it be closer to what it was supposed to be and having the audacity to exceed in everything from, from, from the Olympics and, and, mm. and swimming and tennis and, and sports to business, to education, to, 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 you know, furthering the, this vaccine itself, you know, hey. how are we even still doing this? Right. right. And so when I, when I look at this battle around voter suppression and I think about like how much, how far we've come, you know, this is, it's, it's, you used the word earlier. No, it wasn't paradox, but you used a, a, a word earlier. Um, the, the, the dialectic, right? When we look at, when we look at the fact that on the one hand, um, our previous victories on this issue of voting rights, they, they give us courage to know that there's nothing that we can't overcome, right? That we, that mm. we will get the right. I'm, I'm more convinced more than ever. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what Joe Manchin <laughs> says. I know that we're going to get this voting rights bill. I, in fact, I, I made a prediction on somebody's radio show the other day. I said within 30 days, we're going to have the voting okay. rights legislation passed. Well, we're going to touch and agree on that one, brother. We ain't going to let sure you out there by yourself. Go ahead. <laughs> I believe in that. I believe in that. But the, the, the paradox is this. We shouldn't be fighting for something that was supposed to be ours in 1870. But the 15th mm. Amendment, you know, it's it's highly problematic that that amendment wasn't enough. Then we needed a Voting Rights Act of 1965. Then we needed to get that reauthorized every 15, 20, 25 years. And now here we are having a fight for a John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act to restore something that was taken away from that 1965 act. And, and we, then we haven't even talked about the fact that that same act was then further weakened just a few months ago with the more recent Supreme Court decision in Bronovich. And so here we are hmm. right now, we've got less voting rights than we Come had on. back in August and September of 1965. Wow. Because wow. at least in ninth, August, September of 1965, we had the full Voting Rights Act. And here we are, 2021, we've got less protection than what we had in 1965. That's the that's the paradox that we're that we're dealing with. James. That we're, we're we're moving forward and we're gaining victories, but at the same time, at some point, we got to question the fundamental nature of our relationship to this democracy. At some point, we got to get into some deeper questions. Lonnie Guinier tried to have a whole discussion on proportional representation, and mm. that discussion got squashed. <laughs> Who wait? Imagine, oh, when did that? Why? When did that get squashed? Help me! Help me with that history. Yeah, that that discussion back in back in '92 when <laughs> when when saxophone playing Bill Clinton got elected and, <laughs> and, and was gonna nominate was was gonna nominate you know people thought he was black and then he nominated Lonnie Guinier to be assistant um, 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 secretary in the, the Department of Justice and and then he pulled the nomination because people were afraid of Lonnie Guinier's writings on this notion of proportional representation. And we won't go too deep into it right here, but it, proportional representation challenges the very ways that we even get representation in yeah. Congress and in some other bodies. Mm -hmm. it, 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 would, it would do away with, <laughs> with the gerrymandering that yeah. we're mm -hmm. trying to deal with in the For the People Act, but it also re it, it would force us to rethink what black power and black representation looks like yeah. in this democracy, they didn't want to have that discussion. So they no. pulled her, he pulled her uh, nomination so that she couldn't imagine that she was sitting in Congress being questioned by senators and there was a real detailed discussion of proportional right. representation That's being right. broadcast on, on, on media every That's day right. and introducing this entire country to this notion that they yes. don't want us to know about. God. Dog it, Cliff, you nailed that thing <laughs> down to the, you broke it down so to sufficiently where it don't have to be broke no more. Mm. Because let me tell you, they do not want the light of any epiphany that there is more mm -hmm. and there's better than what America is doing. They don't want that you're, uh, uh, proportional representation. You're talking about the reason why we can't get any more than two parties, divergers law. Sure. You're talking about sure. the very structure and nature of our system when we should have something more analogous to a parliamentarian system. 
Because mm-hmm. can you imagine if Donald Trump had been president at the beginning, uh, or rather if the pandemic had come at the beginning of Donald Trump's presidency and we're stuck mm-hmm. with four years with an executive that we can't yeah. recall with a snap election, right? They don't sure. want us to have those kind of conversations because it represents mm-hmm. fundamental structural reform that would lend power to black folks. And I think at the end of the day, the fundamental question is, will the Democratic Party as representatives mm. of this imperialistic order, are they going to engage in good faith with black people? Or are you at the end of the day telling mm. us that you never really meant for us to actually get power because you're going to use the filibuster as an excuse to re- uh, to keep us from getting it? Brother Cliff, get the last word. Mm. Hey, you, you, you hit it right on the head. <laughs> um, but at the end of the day, we and, and I'll, I'll add on to what you just said, Manson and Cinema. As much as we got to push back against them, there has not been enough discussion around how it's not just them. You you got a bunch of other senators that are That's basically right. using them as cover, right? That's right? And so this ain't this ain't just a mansion cinema problem. This is a, a democratic senate problem. This is a, a democratic White House problem. This is a democratic party problem and that's not to excuse the republicans i don't don't, people sometimes say oh why are you letting the republicans off the hook we're not letting them off the hook we know who they are right they're too busy with dewormer bro they too busy (laughs) crapping out their intestines because of this dewormer we can't talk to them That's right. Cliff, That's right. That's Cliff right. your podcast, your 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 new podcast, Black Power Revisited. Um, where can people get the first couple of episodes of that? Yeah, you can check me out. I've got the links on my on my Twitter. Go to Cliff underscore notes. Um, and you can get the links there. You can go to the link tree there. You go to my website, uh cliffalbright.com, and you can get the links to the to the podcast as well as some videos and the, the video that you were just showing and some other videos as well. And so go to cliffalbright.com. Check me out on Twitter, Cliff underscore notes, and you can check out the podcast, which will soon be featuring none other than Benjamin Dixon. <laughs> yes, indeed. And that's why I like the podcast format, because we could we could just run on and on and on and on as long as our heart's content. Um, but we're out of time this morning. And 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 thank you, brother, for for being willing to come here, because you you stay on those streets and you are doing yeah. you're causing good trouble, man. So yeah. we want to continue to support you in any way we can. Brother Cliff Thank Albright, you. co-founder of Black Voters Matter, DJ Exclusive. Take us to a quick break. When we come back, we're going to close it out with just some black joy. We'll be right back after this. Appreciate you, Cliff. Thank you so much, sir. Y'all make sure y'all stay tuned. We're going to wrap up real quick. Ain't going to tell you tell him I need my money We'll right see. Now. I'm feeling the Mashana now. <laughs> hey, man, make sure that y'all hit that like button, y'all. If you have not already... Yeah, if you have not become a patron already, patreon.com slash like it or not, patreon.com slash like it or not, like it or not, and become a patron today. I can't talk, I can't drink my coffee. Jesus! My Tuesday is becoming a Monday, and my Monday is becoming a Tuesday. It's like the snozberries tastes like snozberries. <laughs> and then make sure that y'all stay tuned and hit that like button, man. Shout out to everybody on YouTube, Twitch, Twitter, uh, Facebook. Where are you streaming from, man? Good morning to you and stay tuned. Justice, good morning, Justice. Every time I hear the song, I think about it's my money and I want it now. I forgot the name of that the thing on people. Tyler, thank you for your super chat. Tyler says, love Cliff. Appreciate all the love in here. Greatly appreciate you, Tyler, man. Why do melons have weddings? Why do melons have weddings? They cantaloupe. (laughs) 
<laughs> David, I didn't, I, I didn't put any in there. I did not, brother. I, I think I did, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> so y'all don't get it. Cantaloupe, can't elope, cantaloupe. No, okay, cool. <laughs> Susan says, give me my money right now. <laughs> 877 cash now. <laughs> man, why do y'all influence me? Y'all know I don't have no sense, man. Y'all know I ain't got no sense. All right, y'all. All right. Welcome back to the screen, mother from another brother from another mother. I told y'all I cannot talk today. Jesus. What's up, buddy? It's been. No, I'm not on a break, Benjamin. Well, it's Ben and Benjamin. Ben and Benjamin. Ben. <laughs> come on, come on, come, come on over, come on over, come on over. What do you need? What do you need? What's up? Is everything okay? Yeah, I want to tell you something funny. Okay, you have to oh, tell me. Yes, <laughs> I love it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I go. Out. So my time is coming to an end a little sooner than later. Um, I'm gonna have to text message my beloved Jada <laughs> to come and uh, get. Get who I'm calling. I'm starting affectionately to call chitterlings. My get, come get my chitterling. No, I'm joking. The chitterlings. <laughs> the chitterlings do. <laughs> what you saying? They uh, stink. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, have you seen Tales from the Crypt? Oh hell yeah! Oh, no, no, Tales from the Hood. Tales from the Hood. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> hell yeah! Remember what he called. The little the black dudes that it, well can't say it on air. The little the little dolls. Yeah, yeah. Remember what he called them? See, that's that's really, that's kind of what a sort of I gotta call you know, do my kids. Not I'm trying faces. to remember. I'll tell you in the after party. Did it come? Did it start with a J? No, it starts with an N. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> So we can't say it in public. You know. <laughs> but I affectionately refer to my kids as my. My chitterlings. Your no, chitterlings. It's, it's, chitterlings. There we go. There we go. My chitterlings. I don't like. A, I don't like chit. I ain't gonna call them my chitterlings because those things. Chitterlings, Come on, are chitterlings. The, chitterlings are the like. Because this is how. Uh, so I got. I mean, obviously, it's spelled chitterlings. That's how chitterlings is spelled, right? Right. But I. Uh, uh, but I picked that up from uh, Tyler Perry back when my dear would just say chitterlings, right? And um, <laughs> and so when I met my wife, um. We met at this at this at this HBCU roundup kind of happy hour thing that we were attending in. And um, I don't know, I just went with it and I asked her if she liked chitterlings. And man, she started giggling so hard, bro. That's when I knew I was in there. So the rest is here. And you and you probably said it just like that. Do you like I chitterlings? Did. Yeah. I said it just like that to be I mean, we were we were having fun. You see, what you gotta do is you gotta mix it up because cause they had trap. We were it's an HBC roundup, so you had everything from Frankie Beverly all the way to trap music or whatever was the analog of trap music back in 2008, right? And so you gotta mix it up, you gotta switch it up. So I decided let me catch her off guard and be as proper as I could. Proper. And I said, Do you like chitterlings? And um yeah, yeah. Well, ten <laughs> years later in a pandemic, we got three kids, so it obviously worked. <laughs> Clearly, she liked chitterlings, <laughs> and now we have our chitterlings. Uh, we got a clip. He says, "So David saying we have um, action." No, the clip that I want, David, is the one of the mother who's making the like she just lost it. There is a, a clip. I know I wanted to close with Black Joy, but now that we're talking about families. There's an unvaxxed mom lashing out at a judge who suspended her parental rights. Now mm. we 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 covered uh we covered a portion of that during uh on the clock with Georgia Ford. But I want to play that clip again because there's a little bit more from that that I want to squeeze out of it because I just really cannot imagine um something in political science that we call rational actors. Hmm. I think it's clear that we're not dealing with rational actors anymore because not only have they suspended with their sense of self-preservation for themselves, they want the permission to be able to put their children's lives at risk and dare us to say anything about it. And as a result, a mother who only had partial custody of her 11 year old child has lost custody, um, any custody rights because she refuses to get the vaccine. Hmm. And this child is not old enough to get the vaccine themselves. That's the rub. So here's the here's here's the problem. Here's the dilemma that we're facing. A mother who refuses to get the vaccine, who is saying that I have the right to see my child. That is my child. But that child cannot get the vaccine themselves. And we're in a full blown pandemic. Should a parent be able to put their child's life at risk? Let's take a look at the clip. Hmm. 
It may be a first-of-its-kind case. A Cook County judge here at the Daly Center has stripped a Chicago mom of her parenting rights because she's refused to get the COVID vaccine. And he is a very sweet boy. He's my whole world. You miss him. <laughs> I miss him more than anything. Rebecca Furlitt has been divorced for seven years and shares custody of her 11-year-old son with her ex-husband, what had been a 50-50 split in parenting time. But on August 10th, in an unrelated child support hearing, Cook County Judge James Shapiro asked Furlitt whether she'd been vaccinated. When she told the judge no because she's had bad reactions to vaccines in the past, Judge Shapiro stripped Furlitt of all of her parenting time until she agrees to get vaccinated. I think that it's wrong. I think that it's dividing families, and I think that it's not in my son's best interest to be away from his mother. Furlitt is now asking the appellate court to stay the judge's order, her attorney saying the judge has overstepped his authority. And you have to understand, the father did not even bring this issue before the court. So it's the judge on his own making this decision that you can't see your child until you're vaccinated. We just wanted the mother to pay support. The father's attorney, Jeffrey Leving, says while they were surprised by the order, he believes the judge is making the right call, given the seriousness of the pandemic. And there are children that have died because of COVID. I think every child should be safe. And I agree that the mother should be vaccinated. Leving believes the judge is breaking new ground that could play out in other custody cases as well. No word on when the appellate court will. All right. Um, hmm. James, a lot going I, on there, man. What you think? I, I really think it's more to it. I really think it's more to it. So it almost sounds like she's out here in the streets. And the judge is saying, okay, you've been out here in these streets, but have you gotten vaccinated yet? Because it it just seems like it's more to that. I don't see that the judge is just going to say, are you vaccinated? And then strip her parental rights away. I really think it's 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 some more stuff that's going <laughs> oh, on that James. nobody is saying. that Because that makes no sense. I, I really do. But shout out to that judge, though. Like, like David said, like there's a backstory of some kind. Like She's done some stuff that you know the judge is saying okay looking at your record have you been vaccinated because like i said going through the stuff that we went through with my niece we've seen how the judges i've seen how those the judges move and some of those attorneys move at least down here in in, in georgia in, in that county so i really think it's, it's more to it that she got that that stripped away from her because she's not vaccinated yeah, James. See out uh, there in the streets, bro. I, I think I think you nailed that actually. Like, yeah, I, I missed that part because check it out. Like, if you are a person who believes that they should not get the vaccine for whatever reason, then we have to ask the question one, why Jeremiah is so loud in the background, right? And then number two, <laughs> you, have to, <laughs> you have to ask yourself the question, are you taking the necessary precautions to ensure mm -hmm. that you are protecting yourself and your child? Um, because there are literally some people who cannot get the vaccine because of a specific condition that right. would put them at risk. And those people are probably doing everything that they possibly can to protect their children by not going out. Absolutely. You're right, James. Excuse That's me. exactly what's not being said in this story. Hi, yeah. Man. It's 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 some more to it. Like the judge probably then found out some information, then done a little digging himself, because mm. they will do that. And he didn't find some shit out and just like, okay, uh, you got vaccinated shit? Mm. No. Okay, cool. Going with right. daddy. Because that's a guarantee. <laughs> like if whatever, whatever, whatever her day-to-day -day life is, yeah. if it takes her into public. And she is not only not getting vaccinated, but she's also refusing to wear a mask hmm. or even to acknowledge that the pandemic is real. Because let's be honest, she might very well be one of those people who go to these city council meetings and start saying their little shaman, whatever, whatever kind of chants they were doing. Right. She might be one of those people in the crowd. So, of course, she is going to be a literal threat to the life of their child, of her child. And so, James, you, it's not even a question to you. You're saying, do you you believe that this this person, this individual, should not be able to put their child's life at risk by refusing to get the vaccine and by being in public and being in those kind of spaces where you're guaranteed to get it? Exactly, especially then if he, her son, has to go back to the father, 
who I'm guessing is probably vaccinated or, or, or maybe not, or maybe can't get the vaccine and give it to him or any other of his family members. So to me, honestly, she just gives that she in the street. That's, that's all I see. <laughs> <laughs> give me uh, I can smoky I, eyeliner I, I... and everything. The <laughs> blonde thinning hair. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. That's all I say about that. <laughs> I've got no comment because that's you know what. Let me stop. Let me we not the party. You know, me, yeah. I'm about to go in because my mama know I'm about to go in. Let me stop. Yes, <laughs> let's, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna handle the rest of that one in the after party because I know exactly what you mean. <laughs> yes, man. and yeah. and all essential workers should you know honestly whatever your essential work is you should be um, you should protect yourself. Right. If you can. And most people can. Most of human, the, there would not we would not be able to have a science. Mm, let me choose my words carefully, because there are examples in history where science has been used abusively. Right. But we are in an era where science is sound and people are following reason and logic and truth. And we have an opportunity to resolve this thing through science. But there is a population amongst us who just refuse to accept it. And, and that's fine. If you want to kill yourself like Phil Valentine and these conservative pastors who believe their lives so much that they want to die, so be it. But I Thank think you. as a society, yes, we man. Interject and say, no, you will not do that to even your children, because as a community, as a tribe of humans, um, we have a responsibility to your child especially when you are seeking for the opportunity to harm them by refusing to get the vaccine and by being in public spaces. Um, yeah, James, you nailed that. Yeah. 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 And, and Libra in the chat said, come on, Boba, just last week you was against the mandatory vaccine and passports and stood your ground. What? That was against mandatory vaccines. I said, it's your choice. That's what right. I said. So make sure that we keep up with my point, Libra. Come on. <laughs> it is. I, I don't believe in this. Don't misrepresent choice. the man's argument. Don't represent the man. If you're going to say it, get it all out there and say it right, bro. Put some Sis, respect on his it? argument. Put some respect <laughs> on my name. That's all I'm saying. So make sure, like I said, no, I'm, I am against mand mandatory vaccination just because you don't know what's going on in someone's life. That's what I'm talking about. But it's, it's your decision. But like this brother Ben just said, if you want to take that risk and you want to kill yourself, that's on you. But what you won't do is put my child or my niece or my nephew at risk. Wait a then minute. What's going to happen is, is that you see what just popped up too, right? Put him on the screen. This man said, end your show. <laughs> hey, said, Pascal. End your show. So that you can the Pascal. <laughs> What's up, party people? How y'all feeling? <laughs> <laughs> what do you call a fibbing line? A fibbing cut thing, and I messed it up. No. Shit. I took you for the other conversation, man. Don't I messed it up. Look, I messed it up. Dang, never mind. Hey, so Pascal, I'm taking you're going to have this conversation on your show in the next few minutes. What part of the conversation are you going to pick up on? Oh, that's a that's a very good uh, uh, a very good question. Um, I, I'm actually doing a, a big interview in uh, on my show uh, okay. today. Okay, okay, but yeah, this is a very good question that I'd like to bring up for the end of the show for a call in segment so mm. to, to kind of like yeah you know oh this would uh, be per build yes yes build this would be the perfect space yes now yeah. do you have do you have the call in set up on your channel yet you 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 oh. doing the call ins yes yeah, so i'll be doing okay. a call in later on okay after the interview and all okay. that, um so talking. so maybe they can answer that question mm -hmm. on your call in hour what's the question Absolutely. that because because i don't i honestly don't think parents should be able to listen do what you want to yeah. do but when it comes to your children i think we as a community that's my position mm -hmm. and uh, i think I, that would be something great to hear from the audience on yeah i think it's, it's i think it's really important that if you're going to be out there you know what i'm saying like as james said she for the streets um, <laughs> she, um he had me as she, she for the streets but anyway right. uh, <laughs> you can't tell me Okay. <laughs> anyway, we know where we can find her. If you out there, you know what I'm saying. If you're out there going around, doing and your, we appreciate them, we put I mean, them through college. Go ahead, right, right. right. <laughs> but I mean, you know, if, as a parent, right, you have a certain you have a certain amount of responsibility, especially if you're going to be out there. You, you're not staying at home. You're not doing your work from home. You're being active. You're being out there. You're doing your thing. Whatever it might be, it, it could it could be work. It could be play. Whatever you should take responsibility as far as getting the poke or not getting the poke, right? right. Um, you should be leaning towards getting the poke. 
because obviously still no matter what that's still you're playing roulette you're yeah. playing roulette with yeah. your kids especially you're bringing that back to your kid the kids going to school he's spreading mm. that stuff out to the to the other kids next thing you know you got a huge ass outbreak and that's it, it's it's messy it's yeah. really really messy so I, yeah yeah so i saw you guys talking about that and i was like oh let me jump on really quick my man yeah say hi I always, <laughs> listen we're gonna go ahead because because i also took that as the sandman coming across the skirts of the apollo stage saying your time is up <laughs> <laughs> Because me and Pascal, we were talking about, listen, man, like we we are supposed to end our show at 10 o'clock and then go behind the paywall for our patrons. And right. Pascal's show starts at 10 o'clock, but we be having so much fun, we just run over. Hey, there's um, nothing wrong with that. You know what I mean? That's why, that's why you guys have one of the best shows out here. You know what I'm saying? Hey, hey yeah, you, we trying to get on your level, you know. Flattery would get you everywhere, brother. Everywhere, bro. <laughs> Well, with that said, wait, Pascal. Before we go, and it might it might be too much to ask here, but um, I want to get because um, because you you be having some great you have great content, man. Um, I want you to send over your your uh, like a promo for your show and maybe the introduction to your show because what I want to start doing is I want to end our show with the opening to your show so that we could do what we're supposed mm. to do. We gonna go behind our paywall, Patreon.com forward slash Like It or Not, yeah. and everyone else the is monies. we want them to come over there. And support you yeah uh absolutely yeah, yeah I, I can send that to you no doubt i, I would love okay. to be able to try to make that a cohesive cross-pollination is what i like yeah cross-pollination yes <laughs> i love it yes I that's love it, it. <laughs> um pascal uh, da- uh james uh, D- uh david in the background shout out to rebecca um who uh, and shout out to the people of haiti pascal we got these pictures we're going to share them with you shout out to dr mac who was not able to join us today because he is probably out there on 18 whole baptist church <laughs> but i get it and i love it georgia fort on the clock and the entire team james take us out of here and everybody hey. go see pascal Real quick, Pascal. Uh, yeah. No. What does Here a nosy pepper do? No, James. No. What does a nosy pepper do? <laughs> what is a what, 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 what does a nosy pepper do? <laughs> I don't know, man. It <laughs> gets jalapeno business. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Three, three bald Why? men walked into the stream. <clears throat> <laughs> I'll see y'all Why? next time. <laughs> Jalapeno business. Why, James? Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> Love y'all mean it, man. Make sure that y'all uh, sl- slide over and over to the Brother Pascal show. And stay tuned and check him out, y'all. As usual, we will see y'all in the morning. <laughs> Sometimes I crack myself up. Y'all don't realize and understand. <laughs> Love y'all, man. Meaning to see y'all tomorrow. Deuces. Deuces, y'all. I will see y'all tomorrow morning. Enjoy your Tuesday. <laughs>